Hello and welcome to The Game Changers, the podcast where you'll hear from trailblazing women in sport who are literally knocking down the barriers to challenge the status quo for women and girls across society. I'm Sue Anstis and I'd like to start with a big thank you to our partners Sport England who support The Game Changers through the National Lottery. My guest today is professional golfer Megan McLaren. As well as being a hugely successful golfer, Megan is also a significant voice in the sport, commenting on the game and the culture that surrounds it through her hugely popular blog and social media presence. They graduated from Florida University in 2016 with a degree in English and political science and seven Division I college golf victories. She was a member of the victorious 2016 Curtis Cup team, won two Ladies European Tour Access events, and in 2017 received the LET Order of Merit. She's a three-time winner on the Ladies European Tour, a winner on the LPGA Symmetra Tour in the US, and is currently ranked six on the Ladies European Tour Order of Merit. And as you'll hear, Meg's incredibly passionate about gender parity in golf. So, Meg. It's been a pretty momentous last few weeks for women's golf. I wonder if I can start by asking you about what happened at the most recent European tour event in Sweden. Yeah, I mean, we're uh, recording this at a pretty incredible time, actually, because they had, for anybody who doesn't know, the men's European tour or DP World Tour, as it's known now, had a joint tournament with the ladies European tour. So basically the men and the women play the same tournament one trophy so the prize money is whoever finishes first you know it's there's no split between the men and the women and they just set it up so that there's a slight difference in t positions to try and take account for obviously the biological differences that the men have in terms of being stronger more powerful so we play off slightly forward tees they've had maybe three or four of these tournaments over the last couple of years and this was the first time that a female player has won one of them she didn't just win it either she won it by I think by nine shots and she was 14 shots ahead of the next female so it's a pretty extraordinary moment for I think for golf as a whole to be honest not just for women's golf and you did comment you wrote on twitter that you'd begun to think it was just too hard to make the men women balance work so what did you mean by that like I said, I've played a few of them now and I thoroughly enjoy it. I have to say like playing with the men is really, really interesting, but it's incredible how you hear some of the men think it's unfair against them because obviously we're, we're playing from forward tees. And then the women think it's unfair for them because we don't think maybe there's enough difference sometimes. And there's also obviously other subtle differences, like the way the men spin the golf ball is different so they can access different pin positions and obviously the tournament organizers do a hell of a job to try and to try and account for all those things but it just it feels like such a lot of work you know when you're still not going to make everybody happy and on top of that which I'm sure we'll go into you have the the kind of negative aspect of social media in a situation like that so my personal preference would be you have the men and women in the same place but you know, playing for the same amount of money in an ideal world, but for different, two different tournaments. But having said all of that, seeing what happened and the reaction to it just made me sit back and go, you know what, this is exactly why we needed something like this. And, you know, fair play to the people who have made it happen. It's interesting, isn't that feedback on the, where the T should be? I saw a chart that showed where there was an advantage more to the females, where there was more for the men, and, whatever, and actually it was very much in favour of the men. Like there wasn't overall across all of the T's, it, the women weren't advantaged any more, in fact, they're less so than, than the men it looked. Yeah, because I think the thing that people seem to forget is we try and work it back from the green. So rather than it being a case of, okay, on average the men hit it, I don't know, 50 yards further than the woman. It's about what club you're hitting into the green. Because if we both hit from 150 yards into the green, that's a completely different club for the men than it is for the woman. So how the golf ball comes off the club face, like I said before, how you can then access different pin positions is different. So the ideal solution is to have you hitting the same club into the green. So a guy hits a seven iron and a girl hits a seven iron to try and balance things as much as you can. But even then, you know, you've got different course layouts. It doesn't always allow for things like that to happen. And that's where I think you can maybe start to lose 
the essence of what a tournament should be because you're you're trying to manipulate things too much but you know i would way rather they were trying to do something like this than not trying to do it so indeed and i think as you said it made so much noise and it certainly was i saw it across social media and people talking about it so from that perspective it certainly had a huge impact yeah i'd like to think it you know it kind of cut through the golf barrier a little bit because there's not many other sports that could even attempt to do something like that i think and obviously there's been been a fair bit of controversy recently with transgender athletes and and how you kind of define you know the lines between what male sport is and what female sport is and i think golf's in a really cool position to to have slightly blurrier lines because i don't i don't think that's a bad thing golf was very much a part of your family growing up so i wonder if you can tell us a little bit about uh, your, your kind of life and, and how golf did play a part it's funny it's one of those things that was just part of my life like as early as i remember it never felt weird to me that I was the golfer you know it was just like my mum and dad both played they both worked in golf both good golfers and both their families played as well so it was just it was just something I did from a young age and summer holidays were spent being dropped off at the golf course in the morning and picked up on my parents way home from work you know I played football as well whenever I was a kid and they were just the two things that I loved to do um, and it was only as I got a little bit older and kind of went through the the different pathways and kind of realized that I could be quite good at it, that I maybe took it a bit more seriously. But, you know, for me, it's been a really cool part of my journey that it was just something that I enjoyed doing and did it because I wanted to, not because I was pushed into it. And did you ever question it as you were growing up? Was it, or was it always assumed that that was going to be the, the path for you? I don't think it was assumed whenever I was young. Like I said, I think it was just something that I did. And I was never like a superstar whenever I was young. I was just, I think, gradually got better. So it was something that if you kind of just continue down this path, then something might happen. There was a while there where I think I definitely preferred football. You know, I was a massive Newcastle mm -hmm. United fan, like wanted to be like Alan Shearer. And I think my dad was probably a little bit savvy at the time and knew that there might be more money for me <laughs> in golf. Although... Obviously, the way things have gone the last few years, women's football has really opened the doors. So, so no, it's, you know, it's all worked out better than I could have hoped, really. And when did you get onto that pathway in terms of international play? Um, I think I was probably in, in England. They had like regional camps and things. So I was probably in that from 13 or 14. And then kind of, you know, I was maybe moved around a little bit to start with before I really broke through to like the full national squad or the, the England girls squad whenever I was maybe 16 or 17. So it all kind of fit together at a good time, you know, as I was kind of looking to my future, I was also getting better and being noticed a little bit more. And I mentioned that you went to Florida on a university scholarship. So how does that recruiting process work for young golfers? Do you go looking for a place or do they come looking for athletes? Um, it's a little bit of both. Obviously, it's it's come on even further now and since I finished college. But I think we hired a company because there's quite a lot of companies that, you know, recruit athletes to then help them search for the right fit for them because it's quite an overwhelming prospect whenever you're, you know, 16 or 17 and America seems like a very, very big place. You know, there's maybe 200 Division One schools for golf, which, you know, you say you play at a division one school and you think, oh yeah, that's great. But you know, how do you pick from 200 places? So I think that the sort of best ranked players will, will have coaches come after them, obviously. Um, and people get signed up from a scarily young age, but I didn't really know what I was looking for. And I was glad I had a bit of guidance, but also knew enough people to, to kind of have a little bit of an idea about the pros and cons of different things. And why Florida? Why was that your choice? Honestly, the the sort of not very subtle reason of the weather. I just <laughs> was like, I feel the cold so badly. And I was like, I really just wanted to be able to practice all year round. And I thought if if I'm able to do that, how do I not get better was kind of my main philosophy back then. So probably still holds true now. But <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. And what's the uh, progress then from after university, the process from transitioning from an amateur golfer to being a, a full professional player 
Yeah, I mean, gosh, I could probably talk about that for a long time. <laughs> um, I think as I got into maybe my third year in college, so it's a four year program. I think my third year was kind of the point where I was like, okay, you know, I'm definitely turning professional when I'm done with this. I think I treated myself as a professional from from about that time and sort of all the decisions that I made were with golf in mind, with my performance in mind. So it felt like quite a natural progression. But equally, having said that, when I did graduate and the kind of the next steps didn't necessarily go how I wanted them to go, because I think I graduated in the May and turned professional in the December of that year because there was a few a few big amateur events that I wanted to play before I turned professional but in that time frame I definitely had some doubts you know it had those those moments that I think every professional athlete does where you just go am I good enough for this am I kidding myself is it going to be completely different now that I'm out of a kind of quite protected environment but eventually you just have to make the plunge I think otherwise you'll you'll always find reasons not to do something. And for those that don't necessarily follow golf, this could be another hour, couldn't it? But could you outline uh, the kind of current setup and structure for women playing golf in Europe and that ambition then to play on the LPGA? Yeah, so there's two main tours in Europe. So there's the LET Access Series, which is the feeder tour. And that's the one that I played first um, for like a year. And then there's the main tour, which is the Ladies European Tour. So that's basically the primary tour for all female professional golfers in Europe, but obviously open to anybody around the world. And the schedule now, the past couple of years has got a lot stronger. So there's probably 30, around 30 tournaments this year. And they can be in Asia. They can be obviously in Europe. We've been to Australia. And then there's lots of other tours, I mean, all around the world. But the LPGA in America would be what's considered the strongest tour where the majority of the best players in the world are. So there's different ways to get to that tour. So last year, I think you mentioned, so I played on the LPGA Symmetra Tour, it was called then, which is the feeder tour. So the top 10 at the end of the year get automatic promotion to the LPGA. So I just missed out on that. But there's also pathways through playing in Europe as well. There's different ways of qualifying. So you just have to kind of figure out what the what the best pathway for you is and and I guess as well what you enjoy the most. I think that's important too. And in terms of your career, I mentioned some of them in the instruction there, but as you look back so far, what are the big highlights for you? Oh gosh. Um I think as as an amateur winning the Curtis Cup was you know, I I'm not sure anything will ever top that. It's every two years and it's Great Britain and Ireland against America and America have performed better, I would say, have been quite dominant in recent years. And that was 2016 that we won. And I don't think we've won it since. And the team we had that year, you know, a lot of them have gone on to success as well. And it was just, you know, one of those environments that just golf doesn't have very much of that team, you know, everybody pulling together. So that was very, very special. And my you know, each of my tournament victories that I've had since turning professional, they've all been special in their own right. The first one is obviously the most, probably the most special feeling, but then equally, the longer you play for, the more, the more demons you have to fight and the more satisfying I think each victory is after that. So I've been very lucky to get those experiences. You write beautifully. And if anyone hasn't already done so, I would absolutely recommend they find your blog and I'll share a link to it in the show notes. Uh, That's actually how I first became aware of you in a a Twitter thread that I later shared with your permission, I think, in the opening chapter of my book. And it was about the inequalities of pay and and coverage in in women's golf. So what do you feel are the, the biggest challenges facing women's golf? I think exposure is still the main one, which is why I know we touched on it, but events like the mixed events are so important because it just gives a platform that isn't usually there. So I would never argue necessarily that we as women in golf deserve exactly the same amount of money as the men when it comes to prize money, because I understand that there are a lot of factors that influence it and people aren't just going to throw marketing and sponsorship dollars at a sport that doesn't receive the same amount of TV revenue, for example. 
as the men's game. But the bit that I've always tried to make the case for is that that doesn't just become like that overnight. Men's sport, and this is obviously across multiple sports, you know, across the whole world, really. They've been pushed for years and years, for decades, and we're playing catch up in pretty much every area. And I just think if we are given a chance that eventually it will catch up. So when people make the argument of supply and demand, I think the demand will be there just as much as it is for the men's game, certainly in golf, because women's golf actually has a lot of things going for it that men's golf doesn't always, but it just needs to be given, I think, a similar opportunity to grow as the men's game has been. And then you can start to see, you know, prize funds increase and whether it has to come from the top down to filter into grassroots or it needs to go from the bottom up. I'm not sure what the answers are, but I think at every single level, if more opportunities are given, then I think the revenue increases across the board. And you mentioned that kind of pushback that you hear from social media and others in terms of the women's game doesn't deserve that same coverage because it doesn't have, uh, or same funding doesn't have the coverage in the viewers and so on. But how do you feel we can go about educating people to share what you've just stated there, the history that sits behind why women's golf is where it is in comparison to men's? I guess the easiest way to answer people when they say that is to kind of look at if you look at one of the biggest men's events, or even, to be honest, any men's event that you watch at the weekend or the past US Open that's just finished, if you put a women's event straight into that production, I think it would be very, very different to what you actually do watch whenever you see it. And there's, you know, there's a ton of factors that bounce off that as well in terms of the advertising that comes before or the storylines that are already created going into the event that all drive your interest and all engage you before it actually starts. And if you kind of like put that perspective on it, I think it kind of, you know, it makes people realize that it's not just as black and white as they think it is, because there's a whole range of factors that aren't just what, what the performers do on their stage. You know, it's, It's about how that stage comes across to the viewer as well. You shared a very honest tweet at the beginning of the year explaining how little you actually earn without sponsorship, and it certainly created lots of debate. But how much are the women that play on the Ladies European Tour, the LET, earning right now? (laughs) That answer is very varied. So I'll give you an example. The, The tournament that we were just talking about, the mixed event, Lynn Grant won it, who's she's having an incredible year. So she won just over 300,000 euros for winning that tournament. She won two weeks before that in another Ladies European Tour event, obviously not a mixed event, just a standard Ladies European Tour event. And she won 30,000 euros, so 10 times less. It's hard to kind of explain to people that, yes, there are opportunities and the opportunities are getting better and better, but it's still not like that across the board. So you can have a really good year and earn maybe £70,000 or $70,000, but your expenses are going to be close to that for a year. And I think that's also the bit that people kind of don't always grasp when you've also got your living costs on top of that. We have to pay for rent and pay for fuel and groceries the same as everybody else. But the actual cost of being a professional golfer is probably a lot more than than people realise. Your blog talks very openly about the mental challenges of playing golf and competing at the kind of highest level of sport. What's the response been to your sharing content like that? It's been amazing, to be honest. I, I actually just played a program yesterday and I played with a, a girl who's at college in America who I didn't know beforehand. And both her and her mum said to me that they'd like read my blog and sometimes her mum sends her something that she finds because she's like you know look it's okay like just because you've had a bad round or you're having a bad spell it's other people struggle too and to be honest that's the biggest reason that I've kept doing it is whenever I get players say things like that because sometimes I feel like I'm talking to an empty void and like I'm just sharing my thoughts which helps me personally but the reason I started doing it in the first place was because 
I was pretty sure other people felt the same way. And there isn't always a space to acknowledge that and just to share some of those struggles. That's kind of the most positive thing that that has come out of it for me. I was thinking as I read your blog, you're a little bit like Adele and that you seem to write more when you're struggling with life and things. <laughs> <laughs> it is, do you know what? It's like, it's harder, I think, the more I go because sometimes I feel like I'm repeating myself and I'm probably more aware now that these things do go in cycles and I've kind of already answered a lot of my own questions. So I still maybe think the same things, but I think I, I get through them quicker. So I maybe don't always feel the need to write about them. Um, so yeah, I don't know if me not writing is, is a good thing or, you know, it's probably a good thing for me, like professionally, but you know, I don't know. And have you always loved writing? Was it something you always enjoyed? I think so. Yeah. I remember writing like in school, I always enjoyed if we were asked to, you know, even creative writing, like I, I really enjoyed just using my imagination and I think I must have had kind of a skill for putting my thoughts into words from quite an early age. I didn't always enjoy writing at college. Like I didn't enjoy whenever I had a, a midnight, midnight deadline and a 10 page paper that I hadn't started at 11 o'clock, but who does? But yeah. Well, <laughs> my time management's not the best, but I think I've always enjoyed that process of just like making an argument through words or just making sense of things through, through writing, you know, and just getting from A to B is kind of, that's my way of doing it, I guess. And will you do more of it in the future? Do you think, is there, is there a book in you? Is it something you'll do in oh. your career? <laughs> I don't know. People have asked me that. I don't know if I'd maybe just collate all of my blogs in one place. That would probably be my best. That's why I always think I don't have enough content to make a whole book, but you'd be surprised. Yeah, yeah maybe <laughs> once I start, I can't stop, but we'll see. And you, you're being quite open on Twitter in terms of sharing thoughts and comments. So how do you deal with the negative comments you get? As you say, there is some of that out there on social media. Has it ever led you to change your approach and the things that you share? I don't think it's changed my approach to what I put out there, but it's made me more aware of when to engage and when not to because it certainly affected me in the past I wouldn't go as far to say I've had like mental health problems or anything like that but you know sometimes you'll you'll get into a bit of a back and forth with somebody and it'll even just be somebody that pops up completely out of the blue with a comment that you know like I know is no reflection on who I am or what I think but then I'll be lying there in bed hours later and it will just pop up in my head and you know, I think I got to a point where I knew that I didn't need that in my life and that wasn't affecting me positively. So I think I'm more aware of maybe what is worth taking a hit for and what isn't. I know when when I'm not going to achieve anything, say, by, by posting something or sharing something. And I, I think I'm more aware of when when I will maybe achieve something. In early 2020, you took a decision not to take part in an event in Saudi Arabia, a principled and brave choice. But can you tell us about that event and, and why you decided not to take part? Yeah, it's, I mean, I guess it's still an ongoing thing and it's kind of come even to more prominence in golf this year. Um, and it's quite an odd um, it's quite an odd place to be. And I'm a Newcastle fan. I, that was my follow-up question, <laughs> actually. <laughs> it's, all, it's all quite difficult to process. But yeah, they have, um, the Ladies European Tour had an event in, in Saudi Arabia. I think the first one was maybe 2020. But Aramco, who are a Saudi-based or a Saudi-financed company, I think, They've also sponsored quite a few events on the Ladies European Tour now. So when the first event in, in Saudi Arabia took place, I decided not to play because to me, from the information that I sort of read and the things that you see on the news, I felt like they were, you know, it was all part of a sports washing kind of setup and agenda. And I just didn't feel comfortable being part of it. I didn't feel like I could kind of be the authentic version of myself that I want to portray and to be through everything I do, whether it's writing or social media or my golf performance, to me, they're all connected. And that's the bit that I struggled with separating. Okay, I can go there and play golf. And I know I'm just there to play golf. But I've always 
you know, that's the one thing that I've always tried to be true to is, is connecting all of those versions of myself. And it just didn't make me comfortable to, to try and separate them. Did others feel the same? Were you? Um, I think other people struggled with it. Yeah. But I think most people would see it as too big of an opportunity financially to, you know, to hold them back, which I very much understand and may possibly find myself at a point at some time in my career. And if, you know, if I have to choose between going to a tournament that may affect my chance to get into a Solheim Cup or to get onto the LPJ, that's not going to be a black and white decision for me. I know other people have struggled with it and other people have the perspective that it is a positive thing. And there's, there's clinics for young Saudi women and maybe there's Saudi women attending the tournaments, you know, I understand those perspectives as well, but obviously everybody has their own opinions on what is really happening and what isn't really happening. It leads us really into live and the new men's golf tournament exhibition funded by the Saudis. And the first event took place at Hemel Hempstead last week. The players paid hundreds of millions of pounds just to take part. So I'm interested in your thoughts on that as it's kind of unfurled the story in the last few weeks. Yeah, it's certainly, I mean, it's certainly a fascinating like thing to watch unfold from, I mean, sort of like, obviously it's, it's my sport but I'm also on the outside because it isn't something that affects me. So it's a very strange time, but it's probably obvious from what I've already said. I don't like it. I don't like any of it. I don't like what's happening. But that's probably from a broader sense than just that it's happening in golf. The whole kind of principle of, of throwing lots and lots of money at people to promote your image when it doesn't seem like things are really changing. I, I don't like that. I understand that golf probably has things that it can be better at in terms of its its top product, which would be the PGA Tour. You know, there's things that people don't like and there's things that can be improved on, but I'm not sure that the purpose of the Live Tour is really to do that. And that would be my my main issue with it. And then you can obviously obviously argue whether, you know, players should be loyal to, to how they've created their wealth up to now and what's given them their career and their profession you know that's maybe for each person to decide but I think I've always taken the view that if you leave everybody else to make that decision then you know nobody ever does make the decision and nothing ever changes so at some point you have to decide if you want to be bigger than just yourself I think. But you can understand why a golfer could potentially sacrifice a chance to play on future PGA tour events or the Ryder Cup in order, in theory, to make him enough money to, you know, rich for life, for his children's lives, etc. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And that's, that's one of the things that I find really difficult. And we've had conversations about it, you know, with, with my friends on tour, like, would you do it if, if an opportunity like that came your way? And it's very hard to look past the, the immediacy of, okay, I know next week I'm going to take home whatever it might be, $40 million at a minimum, you know, I, I completely understand why some people would turn around and go, well, I can't say no to that, whatever happens next, because I don't know if I'm going to get an opportunity to earn that money again. And it's a very, very difficult position to be in, regardless of, of whether you question the source of the money or not, just the, the whole kind of thing that has unfolded with the PJ Tour conflicting with, with the Live Tour. You know, it's, it's a tough spot to be in. And I don't envy those players, even though they're, you know, going to be a lot richer than I am. It's it's not a nice thing to have to deal with either. And it's interesting that no women were included. I think the organisers said they had spoken to some of the female players who didn't feel it was right for them at the moment. So I, I don't know what your thoughts are there or if they had approached you with their 40 million. You know, it, it's a, I guess it's a different conversation to be had, isn't there? It is. Yeah. It's, um, I mean, it's like I said, it's a difficult one because, you know, obviously no, as far as I know, no women were invited to play or no women did play, but equally Saudi money has financed a lot, a lot of golf, female golf over the last couple of years. And there's a lot of players sponsored by Saudi golf. And 
you have to look at other companies and go, why are you not doing that? But it's, you know, it's a very complicated web. And like I said, with, with football, you know, Newcastle United are the team that I've supported since I, before I could walk. And like, I am so passionate about and we've waited a long time to have sort of an injection of, of kind of energy and positivity in our club. So on the one hand, I think that's incredibly exciting. But then obviously it, there's there's conflict there with, with what I believe. So it's can you enjoy enjoy one thing and acknowledge that you're uncomfortable, you know, with another? It's quite a big, deep, profound conversation, <laughs> isn't it, for, <laughs> for Monday evening. Diversity in golf is a long debated issue. And it's been fascinating to see Korean, Thai, Japanese players all in the th- women's top 10, yet the men's top 10 feels far less diverse. I wonder why there is that disparity between the men's and women's game when it comes to diversity. Yeah, that's an interesting question. The LPJ, obviously, over the last 20 years has become incredibly diverse. And a big part of that is sort of the influx of, of Korean golfers who, a lot of whom were kind of inspired by Seri Pak winning the, I think it was the US Open. Golf just took off massively over there. And the the kind of pathways, I think, that have developed have really just produced a wealth of talent. And there's sort of Korean tours as well that just produce superstar after superstar. And funnily enough, I think that's, kind of a good parallel to draw with what could happen to women's golf if you know on the whole if you kind of have opportunities like that that all of a sudden a whole you know a whole country got behind golf as a sport and saw it as a viable career and it you know it creates creates a generation of of talent and of wealth as well and I think maybe in in the men's game America has just kind of dominated that those pathways for longer than has maybe happened in the women's game and i think you're going to start to see over the next 10 years an influx of of players from all over the world on the pga tour i think it's already starting to shift if you look at the world rankings there's a lot of europeans in the top 10 there's australians you know it's it's certainly a global game um and i think as you kind of alluded to diversity hasn't been its strongest point so it can only go forward from here as well and the pga's worked hard it seems to be like facing the issue in terms of its staff and they publish figures about gender and ethnic diversity of those working in golf just before the pandemic but do you feel enough is being done in terms of making golf more accessible to those from and not just ethnic different ethnic backgrounds but socio-economic backgrounds whether that's in europe or, or across the world uh, there's always more that that can be done always i think golf is is definitely waking up a little bit over the past five or so years and i know martin Sumbers at the rna has has done a lot to push kind of opening golf's golf's barriers really and kind of trying to build those inclusivity agendas into what he does and not not to have people see it as such a rich white man sport because that probably still is the association with golf and I still have to take a step back sometimes and go you know the the clause for the PJ Tour membership that that stated it was white only you know that that existed until I, I don't want to put a date on it because I might be wrong but it's a lot more recent than you would imagine and that's quite a scary thought that people listening to that in their lifetime that clause would have still existed which I think shows that golf has had a lot of catching up to do in terms of changing its image. And I do think it's starting to get more into schools and kind of trying to pull more people into, into it from, from less wealthy backgrounds, especially with COVID, because it, it really kind of made people appreciate this is a way to be outside and to be safe. So I hope that golf can really kind of draw on the things it does have going for it and pull more people in because it's, you know, it's a fantastic sport in my opinion. And you mentioned whether the change happens from a top down or grassroots up, but great news this year that the US Open, Women's US Open had a new sponsor and the subsequent prize purse of $10 million, I think. So not 
you know, not reach the men's, but moving in the right direction there. So I guess how excited were you for that news and what does that mean more broadly for, for the game? I think it's brilliant. I I was shocked in the best possible way at that announcement. But I think seeing things like that just makes you sit back and go, wow, like they're serious about this. It's not just saying the right things to please the right people. And that's always been the kind of balancing act of, you know, the things that get said versus the things that actually get done. And I think as players, it really makes us feel respected and to really go, you know what, like people are starting to appreciate that we are professional athletes. We put in exactly the same thing as the men do, as our, you know, male counterparts do. So why should we be valued less when everything that goes in is the same? And everything that comes out is the same in terms of entertainment and skill level. The only thing that's different is the distance that the men can hit it. There's a lot more similarities and differences between the men's and the women's game. So I think just as players to to kind of see that recognized will really help push us on, you know, as as a profession as well. And like I said before, hopefully that has a knock on effect to the people who are watching, you know, the young girls at home who all of a sudden can see you on TV and go, oh my God, she's just won $2 million. You know, how exciting is that? So I think it's all a cycle. One thing affects another, affects another. So hopefully it's it's moving in the right direction. And you've obviously had a, an incredibly successful career with major wins every year, but I wonder what's your long-term ambition for your game? That £2 million prize, I imagine. <laughs> yeah, I wouldn't <laughs> say no to that. But yeah, I want to be, I think I want to be competing in majors, in the major championships and and to really test myself against the best in the world. I want to see kind of just how far my my potential can take me, I guess. And I don't think I'll be satisfied until until I really see that or feel like I've I've kind of maxed out, you know. So as long as I can keep pushing myself for that's that's what I'm gonna do. Hopefully you'll have many more years ahead as a professional golfer. But what what plans do you have once you leave golf from a competitive point of view? I don't think I could leave the game completely. I'm too obsessed with it. You know, there's so many things about it that fascinate me that I don't think I could do something different. So whether it would be working in the media in some capacity or writing about it in some capacity, but I would like to to leave golf better than it was whenever I came to it. So whatever that looks like, you know, I would like to be a part of. Great to talk to Meg about her career and to hear all she's doing to help drive gender equality in golf. If you'd like to hear about other women driving change across sport, do visit fearlesswomen.co.uk where there are details of all of my guests from this and the previous series. You can also listen to all the podcasts on the website and find out more about the Women's Sport Collective, a free network for all women working in sport. You can also sign up for Changing the Game, our weekly newsletter, which highlights the developments in women's sport. And there's more about my book, Game On, The Unstoppable Rise, of women's sport. Thanks again to Sport England for backing the game changes through the National Lottery and to Sam Walker, who does a great job as our executive producer, along with Rory Alsbury on sound production. Finally, thanks to my brilliant colleague, Kate Hannon at Fearless Women. Do come and say hello on social media where you'll find me on Twitter, LinkedIn, Instagram and Facebook at Sue Anstis. And if you've got a couple of minutes, it would be great if you could rate or review the podcast as it does make a big difference to help us reach new audiences. The Game Changers. Fearless Women in Sport. <laughs>